glad that you're here. Um, you should be seeing a slide here in just a moment. That's my uh, family picture slide. You can see some of my joy here. Um, I am the director for Thrive Training, and one of the things I'm very excited about is spreading joy and, and equipping leaders with the skills to thrive. And um, a lot of our training is based on this book called Living from the Heart Jesus Gave You, as well as another book called Joy Starts Here. So I see some familiar friends who are with us. So for most of you, this is all familiar. You know what we're trying to do here. So I just want to say welcome to Bill, and I see Don and Henry, you're with us, Jessica, and John, I'm glad you made it, and Margaret, uh, Marion, and even some uh, Nancy, Richard, Timothy, and a couple new names here. So I'm glad that you're here. Um, this is a great time for us to talk a little bit about how does joy apply to our lives, our ministries, and our families. And so one of my goals for the Pastors Weekly is basically to talk about uh, some of these topics as well as invite some wonderful guests who are going to talk uh, about some of this as it relates to them and their leaders or their ministries, their staff, their families. And, um, you know, I always liken this time to going out for coffee. And um, I love fellowship. I love coffee. But if we're going to go out for coffee, we have to talk. We have to interact. You don't want me to do all the talking because that's going to be kind of boring. I want to hear from you. And my special guest is going to want to hear from you today as well. So please feel free to uh, interact with us. That's really what we're after here. Uh, as much as we all like to talk, we want to hear from you. So that's, uh, that's where we're going today. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my friend and one of my beloved pastors, Pastor Jason Morris. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here. And in case our uh, viewers don't realize this, we've had a serious, serious uh, tragedy happen to our hometown here. Um, just minutes from where Jason and I live, an F4 tornado struck through central Illinois. And uh, that's one of the things I'm going to have Jason talk a little bit about today because his uh, congregation was really impacted by this. And I want all of you to just hear kind of what's been going on, what we're doing, what the needs are here. And because uh, basically you've got a lot of families who have been uh, traumatized by some of the stuff that's happened. So, uh, Jason, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, my name is Jason Morris. And... I am the uh, pastor of New Life North. Uh, New Life Christian Church is uh, a church that functions in two sites, two locations, and uh, we started our second location at uh, Community College here in Central Illinois at the Performing Arts Center about uh, just under two years ago. It was January of uh, 2012, so we're coming up on our two-year anniversary. And um, prior to that, I was the director of worship at our church, and so they said we need a pastor uh, to pastor this site. We think it needs to be you. Uh, I said, okay. So that's kind of how my whole pastoral background <laughs> came into existence. So I've been, I'm relatively new at the pastor gig. Um, I just turned 42, and uh, I don't know, my favorite color is green. What else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, what I'm interested in, Jason, you were actually speaking on Sunday morning on the 18th of November when this tornado was really not that far from, from where your congregation was. Why don't you paint that picture for us? Sure. What was that Sunday morning like? Uh, it was really interesting. Um, I was outside uh, kind of looking at the sky before service. I had heard rumor that there might be some weather. And uh, a gentleman who attends our church named Matt uh, came up to me in the yard out front of the Performing Arts Center and said, um, hey, they're saying that uh, it is for sure we're going to have tornadoes on the ground. They never say that, but they're saying for sure, so you need to be ready. And we don't think we're going to come to church today. And uh, so you need to let, I'm letting you know because we, I feel really bad if we let all of you get hit by a tornado and didn't give you warning. It was kind of funny. And uh, so I said, all right, well, you know, if you hear one on the ground, you'll be my official guy to text me. I have my phone on the stage when I'm speaking. And if, it, if I see a text from you, I'll shut everything down. We'll, I'll take everybody to the basement. And... Uh, and he said, oh, there's a basement here? He didn't know because we're renting the facility and people just don't go down there. And um, I said, yeah. So he said, all right, well, maybe we will come to church. And so um, we kind of went about our business. And I, I met with our um, 
our ushers and a couple of leaders, like an elder and a couple of people that I knew um, carry a certain amount of authoritative weight as volunteers. And uh, I just said, hey, there's a chance we could have tornadoes on the ground. And if that happens, um, we need to be ready to take everybody down to the basement. We're going to go this way on this side and this way on this side. Here's how we're going to do it. And, uh, and after each person I told this to, I qualified and said, there is no way this is actually going to happen. Just chill. It'll be all good. We don't have to worry about, about going to the basement. It's going to be fine. And so, Famous uh, last words. Yeah, I know. I know. And uh, so we kind of got into it. And when I started my message um, that Sunday morning, we'd gone through a time of worship, and people were there, and it was just a normal attended Sunday. And um, we got to the point where I started my message, and the first thing out of the gate uh, was I told everybody, I have anxiety right now, everyone, and it's not because I'm afraid to get, of hitting, getting hit by a tornado. It's because if I tell us all go to the basement, there's going to be a whole group of you that were like, oh, that was a total waste of time. We didn't need to do that. And then if I say, no, you know what, we're going to stay up here and just hope for the best, there's going to be a whole group of you who say, why aren't we in the basement? So I can't win this argument. So you just have to do what I say when it's time, okay? And so they kind of laughed, and I laughed, and, and then we just went forward. Um, and then... Uh, at one point, I was about three-quarters of the way through the message, all fired up, getting excited about stuff. And, <laughs> and that's, when, uh, that's when I heard a bunch of phones all simultaneously uh, do the, the emergency tone. And I said, I can't believe it. We're actually going to have to go to the basement. So um, I told them to head down the aisles, and off we went. There's a hallway in the basement that we all went down and stood in for about 20, 25 minutes. And the storm, uh, you know, it, it hit about four miles away. The tornado hit about four miles away from where the uh, – the uh, colleges, and um, it wasn't, I don't, none of us knew that it had hit, you know, we were just in the basement, I had the little basement outside door open there for a little mm -hmm. bit watching, and there was some wind and rain, but nothing to write home about, and then uh, when it was over, we all kind of went upstairs, and church was over, it was past dismissal time, so we were like, hey, don't forget the special offering we're doing for that food drive on the way out the door, and uh, the usual stuff, see you next week, and I mean, nobody thought anything about mm -hmm. it, so that was kind of how church went on wow. Sunday morning, which was, it was different, and we survived, obviously. So, so when when did you realize that this tornado actually touched ground and and did some damage? What sure. when did you realize? Uh, that? I was driving home and uh, I was supposed to uh, go to lunch with my parents <laughs> and uh, with my family. And um, I was driving home uh, to pick up my uh, my oldest son who was home with the two little kids. Uh, we were uh, my. I'm not trying to complicate everything. My wife was up in, uh, on a trip out of town, and I have six children. So I had left my oldest son with my two littlest because I can't manage all six kids at church while I'm doing my thing. So I said, "You take, yeah. I'll take the other three. And so we were separated is what I'm telling you. And I had, wow. uh, I had called him at about 10 o'clock and said, hey, I hear there's weather. Go to the basement with your little uh, sister and brother. So he had. But then when I tried to call home after church, he, uh, there were so many people on the phone, and I think there was some tower damage. Uh, yeah. over in Washington that um, I couldn't get through to him. So I started getting a little nervous, just mainly because I knew he didn't know where I was. Or he, we couldn't make phone contact. Now, like yeah. that. So uh, yeah. I was driving home, and I had just made phone contact with him. All of a sudden, I was closer to home, and I got a call from another uh, church member who said, hey, we're on our way home, but they've got traffic lined up outside of Washington. We can't get to our house. We think this might be bad. And uh, wow. I said, all right, well, I'll swing by. So I drove home, picked up my other three. We were in my truck. So I had, um, now there's no, like, law enforcement watching this, right? I had seven people in my truck, including myself. <laughs> and, uh, and I had the four little kids in the back, quad cab, and uh, the three across the front, me and my oldest two. And we drove over to Washington, and I called my mom and said, hey, I'll meet you over at Steak and Shake, you know, come over. Yeah, I was like, we're going to be a little late. I'm stopping by to make sure everything's okay. We had yeah. no idea. You know? Wow. So uh, when I first realized what happened was when we drove into town in Washington, um, the place we usually come into is right where my uh, my aunt lives. And she's a 73-year-old, uh, never been married, um, just lives by herself in this uh, nice neighborhood. And I, I, it looked like the whole place was under construction from a distance. And I said, is that construction or is that devastation? Wow. We drove in and uh, lo and behold, the place was annihilated. And uh, so we drove straight to my aunt's house. And um, I mean, I had a four-wheel drive and was climbing over rubble with my truck with my kids yelling, Dad, what are you doing? But we got, <laughs> we got to the house and uh, yelled down in the basement. Mm -hmm. It was pouring rain. It was pretty, pretty crazy. And uh, turns out she was at church during the uh, – During the during uh, storm, yeah. like a whole lot of people in Washington were, which is uh, yeah. pretty cool. But uh, that's kind of how the whole thing came right. into view for me. Okay, and, and I want our, our friends to understand, like, a thousand homes were, were damaged by this. I think over 500 were completely destroyed. Right. Um, 
And I know Jason, you've got some pictures. Maybe we can throw a few of these pictures up. Uh, I just, I've been to some of these areas. In fact, I've seen, I've worked uh, with Pastor Jason and some of his crew on one of our um, elders of, of our church. He lost his home, and it literally looks like a bomb was dropped. And these neighborhoods are leveled. Um, yeah. So, Jason, why don't you show us a few pictures just to give an idea? Is of my screen what we're on right now? About. Yeah, we got it. We, we okay, very it. good. Well, these are some of the guys from New Life, but you can just look over their shoulders, and you can sort of see some of the uh, some of the damage. It just keeps going. These are guys from my church who all came out to help. Um, but you can see, like, this is a pretty good one. You've got damaged houses that are standing out there, plus uh, just ones that are completely leveled. And uh, until you kind of went into the zone, it was hard to understand the level of, uh, of devastation. And so uh, this is just a, you're seeing guys carrying stuff out of basements here. Um, just uh, you can see the rubble right in the background right there. Um, but we tried to tarp the house to keep some of the rain out. And uh, I'll try to get, here's Chris, there you go. <laughs> hey. um, that truck right there in the background um, is, uh, is one of the elders from our church. His house was leveled, and this was his truck that actually ended up in the living room of his neighbor's house. I uh, can't really tell us the living room there, but uh, that's what happened. And uh, just more, I'll just try to scroll through and give you a little more devastation here. I think I have, uh, now you get to see some family stuff, sorry. How about, I hear some. And so, so friends, as Jason shows these pictures, this gives you an idea. Um, this is a neighborhood full of homes that's now leveled. It looks like, right. I mean, just piles of debris everywhere, basically. Yeah. It was kind of like just walking through a junkyard, it sort of felt like. <laughs> and uh, pretty pretty, pretty intense. Um, we're wearing the masks because there's so much uh, insulation all over the place. You're just kind of breathing it, and it's not uh, not real exciting to do that. So there you go. I'll see if wow. I've got one more set of pictures here. Here we go. There's yeah, uh, me and my uh, father at the side of my aunt's house. Um, and uh, that's my aunt. She, uh, she lost so your aunt her. was okay. She's safe. Yeah, she was at church, uh, doing fine, and uh, just sort of, sort of doing our thing. So there you go. That's a nice picture of the devastation. It just keeps going right there. Yeah, we got a little delay. They'll see it in a moment. No, sorry. <laughs> we have Ron right there. Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, wow. Yeah. So um, I just want to highlight. One of the things, Jason, that's been really exciting for me is seeing how churches have responded and um, and hearing the impact. Because a lot of the people, not all the people, but a lot of the people who are home aren't churchgoers, which means many of them aren't Christ followers, we might say. And so one of the exciting things that I've been hearing from the community is how people have watched the church respond to help, to serve, to do whatever they can do. And it's really, um, when, I, when I had a title for our time today, it's How the Church is Growing. There's something that people are seeing in the character of these, these groups that says, wow, I, I really have respect for what the church is doing. I, I really like you guys. Um, is that, what's your experience in terms of how you've been, because you've been out working. I mean, you were out, I think, every day for that week after the tornado. Sure, yeah. Um, I kind of took on the role of uh, New Life Disaster Relief Coordinator, which was, you know, uh, part of the humorous part about you having me on here today, Chris, is like, I, I'm now officially the expert after three weeks of <laughs> I believe it. I need your you need your viewers to make sure they understand. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm just in the middle of it trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, um, you know, I think any time the church uh, takes action and shows uh, love in action more so than just speaking it, uh, there's, just, there's just a lot of impact there. People can see, um, you know, especially you've got a, a government organiz organization like FEMA on the ground there that's taken a lot of flack over the years for, um, you know, not being quick enough and that sort of thing. Um, I don't really want to speak into that. But, um, yeah, yeah. but generally, you know, you've got this group of people that are willing to jump in and help. Um, because they love Jesus and they want to be his hands and feet on the ground. Um, and so, you know, I, I had so many people contacting me, I basically started making a list of names of people who were available on what days, um, making contact with the, with the families from New Life that had lost homes or had damage, um, and then my aunt's place. I only managed about four places during that first week. Wow. And, uh, but just, you know, lining up a crew of eight to come in uh, to, my, to one guy's house and then another crew of ten to come into another guy's house. And, um, 
And when that happens, part of it is you know you're on the you're on the street with all these groups of I mean all these houses are neighbors of, you know they're all neighbors that just have destruction and so like on the house like my aunt's house we had I don't know at one point twenty guys working on it simultaneously and you look wow. next door and there's just a couple of people working and it kind of is a picture of um, of people who have community versus people who don't have community wow. and I think uh, we went after our own folks first which I think is right and good you know it's just part of that world of we're gonna we're gonna go and take care of the people in our church body who are who have um, experienced loss and, and are, are needing the help right now but also I mean one of our one of our church uh, families said right away that their neighbors had made a comment about how much help they had and they, they said yeah we got this kind of help and we're, we're happy to share that help with you too and I mean that's been part of our ongoing conversation which is okay so we've gotten your place kind of to a stopping point how about your neighbors you know how about yeah. how about somebody else you know in the community who's who's had damage that you think doesn't have the level of community that you've got or doesn't have a church home what have you yeah. so um, we've, we've been trying to step in that way um, to be really honest uh, it's been tough to I've actually had way more help than we've been able to connect to actual need, and I think wow. a lot of that has to do with just the uh, demographic of, of the area that was hit. Um, yeah. It wasn't like uh, New Orleans or uh, or even mm -hmm. somewhere that was a poor part of the South kind of thing that happened with yeah. Katrina, and the devastation, while massive, wasn't on the scale of something like right. Katrina. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's a lot of resources here. here. Yes, yeah. Yeah. totally, yeah. Yeah. So how's your congregation doing? You know, as uh, we hear this story, how how are people doing with all this stuff? Well, um, you know, from from the interactions I've had with the people who've had actual loss and damage, um, that group is uh, grateful. Uh, really uh, felt. I mean, we had the next the next Sunday, um, our, our attendance was way up. It was sort of like one of these things where. Um, where it was like everybody just wanted to be together. We actually uh, we actually had pizza after church on Sunday after the tornado just so to have everybody have some time to talk and hang out and just uh, be back together in community. And it was it went over awesomely. I mean, people hung out for a really long time and just connected. And the vibe uh, that you get, I think, when people see all those pictures of devastation, the first reaction is you want to feel uh, compassion and empathy and sometimes just sad for these folks on the other end. Um, it just did not take long for our for our body to really get to a place of hope and um, and how can we help. I had people who uh, lost homes um, completely calling me close to the end of the week saying, well, I think our place is wrapped up. Where can I step in and start, you know, helping somebody else dig out? And uh, so, I mean, it's been, we, I had a couple of people come up and share on Sunday morning about their experiences, um, somebody who helped with the devastation and then somebody else who received help. And um, that was, that was all uh, very encouraging for the body as a whole. And so um, I guess mood, very hopeful, uh, very encouraged, very thankful for one another and for the fact that we were, uh, we were safe during the tornado. It was really interesting to have the number of families that we've got from Washington all together in the basement of the church, no clue what had happened, um, walk out and then go home and find this devastation and then come back together the next week after having a week of, um, of craziness. Because even the people who didn't uh, have much damage, their power was out for the majority of the week. And uh, so they were living in, in uh, kind of a crazy time there. So uh, yeah, wow. does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Now, I think we're getting a little bit of an echo if you can adjust oh, right. your volume. I want to paint a picture for our, our viewers and our friends here. So you've got, uh, what Jason's describing is you've got a lot of people who are impacted. Uh, I believe some of the, the percentages, about 20% of the, the community uh, was lost in terms of the structures. Um, so you've got people who are directly impacted because their house was destroyed, or you have people, they know someone, um, or you have people, people who are just, um, basically impacted because of um, seeing it themselves. I mean, when, when we went through some of these neighborhoods, it, it literally looks like a, a disaster zone, the closest thing that I've seen to a war zone. Um, and um, I have a friend who actually lives on the edge of the, not far from where the Stinsons live, which are friends of ours. Uh, they live in this neighborhood that was hit uh, really, really hard. And my friend was looking out the window, and he says, you know, I didn't think it was that bad. And then I watched the fence start to float into the air in my backyard, and I realized I probably better get to the basement. And he went to the basement with his family. The thing passed, looked out his window, and said, ah, I don't think this was that bad. And then he looked out, uh, went, stepped out on his deck, 
and then he saw basically what those pictures, Jason, that you showed us are. And he was right on the scene. He went from house to house and started to help families. And it was very clear by the descriptions that a lot of families were traumatized. A lot of children were traumatized. A lot of people have post-traumatic stress. They felt their lives were in danger. They felt helpless. They felt powerless. They felt alone. So I had a really neat time because what we're going to talk about here in a moment is what do we do, right, when you've got people who have been so negatively impacted by an experience. So what do you do? How do you help? And because uh, the training that we do, I said, I want to help this guy see if we can find out where God was in the middle of his whole experience. So I prayed with him, and, and this was all new, right? He's um, not really a churchgoer, right? So he wasn't so sure about what I was going to walk him through, but he trusted me. So I said, well, Chris, if you'll, if you'll give me a little more peace, if this will help me have a little more peace, hey, I, I'm willing to, willing to give this a try. So I was able to say, well, tell me about a time, you know, if you've ever felt like God was with you before. Tell me about a time that just makes you smile, a very joyful time, a very a time that a memory that you appreciate something. Yeah, he was nervous. And he said, okay, well, I'll do this. You know, so he took a few minutes and described this wonderful, peaceful, joyful memory for him and his family. And then I said, okay, now we're going to ask Jesus, you know, what does Jesus want you to know about what he was doing in the middle of this, this episode, this time? And it, his response was really, really interesting to me. He said, well, you know, I've never had a thought like this before, but I feel like this tornado was coming, and I kind of feel like God directed this thing to avoid the least amount of casualties. Uh, that he, he steered this thing because it was going after, you know, one, one of the places this tornado hit was it was on its way to a church with no basement. And a police officer saw it coming, started praying, the congregation was praying. The tornado hit the parking lot of this church and then turned away from the church. So he, he started to describe how he felt like God was so carefully directing this tornado to protect families, to protect churches, to protect communities. Um, you know, he just said, this is a weird thought. I hadn't had this thought before. But I, I really feel like God was, was with us here. And he started to describe the peace, uh, peace that he hadn't really had before when he thought about that day. And so I want to talk a little more about this uh, as a resource for churches and some of what we're doing locally. But, uh, Jason, I just want to give you an opportunity. Is there, do you see God working in the middle of this disaster? I mean, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, anytime you have the opportunity to uh, – to step in and bring uh, that practical help on the ground, you'll be in the hands and feet of Jesus. And um, and so, I mean, when I see uh, when I see people who are a little bit, um, you're talking about, you've got an immediate reaction to what happened. You'll come home and your house is gone, right? Um, or and you see your whole neighborhood is destroyed. And um, I've watched some YouTube videos from people who you know had that immediate reaction and, and that sort of thing, and just the uh, the shock and awe and all of that kind of thing that goes with that and the, and the uh, combination of anger, grief, um, just, uh, you know, a lot of negative stuff that comes with the, the idea of, of having everything you own just taken from you in the moment. Um, I, I guess what I've seen is as people have come on the scene to start helping and going through stuff and just doing that rescue process of not just pulling people out of basements but also um, – Helping them truly, I mean, I'm talking about picking up handfuls of, um, of a rubble and insulation <laughs> and stuff and finding that one, you know, that one item that is important to the person who owns the home and uh, that means something to them. You know, I mean, I was having people walk up with a photograph of somebody and, and it was just, you know, it, there was something about those moments where it's like, hey, I found something that belongs to you. And it's not so much the item. It's more... Um, I care about you enough to understand that this item means something to you. And um, I think what that is communicating in the moment is, um, is God's care for the little details of people's lives 
and he's such a he's a god of um, where he does care deeply about everything we think about and what we care about. And he knows what we like and what we don't like, and um, he like a like a father to a child. He wants what's best for us, but he also just wants us to experience. Um, great pleasure in this life and joy in this life and it's like um, and he knows that uh, a, a picture that means that something memorable to us that we care about he cares about it too and so um, I guess as, as I watch people go through that process of giving uh, of finding items and saying hey look what I found um, there was a there was a real sense of, um, of Jesus being present in the moment because it was just such a it was such an encouraging time, I guess, and uh, mm -hmm. and so um, you know, do I see God working? Yeah, I'd say that's probably <laughs> probably the way that I've seen Him working the most is just mm -hmm. in that direct connection between people out there doing the work on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I mean, part of that curse is because that's what I've been spending my time doing. So I mean, yeah. um, you know, so that's kind of where my eyes have been open the most. Um, you know, if I if I were doing some behind the scenes stuff, you know, I we got your. Uh, got your email saying, you know, all right, well, how can we step in and start help, helping people who have, uh, like, post-traumatic stress and this sort of thing? And I thought, wow, I didn't even think of that. Great job. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm sure you'll have some awesome stories to pull together here as people begin to, as we begin to go through that process. Um, mm -hmm. I just thought of you guys the other night. I was, uh, I was laying in bed um, sort of after a week of, of rubble digging, mm -hmm. and I kept mm -hmm. waking up every every half hour to an hour dreaming about digging through rubble. And uh, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow. is something wrong with me? Now, it's kind of passed and <laughs> gone away, but I never really had any major angst in, in, the, yeah. in the situation. It was just sort of like I kind of went into let's go mode and yeah. let's help people if we can. And um, But I can only imagine if, that if that was happening for me, and I'm not even personally affected uh, in the sense of I haven't lost anything, um, for people who have gone through the uh, through the ringer of this whole thing, they they are going to need um, these moments where they're reminded that God's present, that mm -hmm. they're not alone, that uh, that there's hope for the future, um, all this kind of stuff that uh, that I think um, is part of uh, yeah. you guys' ministry, and I'm hoping yeah. that we continue to be the ministry of the local church here. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Jason. This is this is a perfect segue to what I want to talk about. Um, and it's so exciting to hear what you're sharing because you guys have been on the ground. Your presence has been felt, and uh, boy, the needs the needs great. And and I hope, friends, as you're hearing this, um, you know there is the, a picture being painted here that the devastation is broad, it's wide, but what God is doing in the middle of it is, is even more so. Um, I have to say, I've I've just heard these wonderful stories, uh, and similar to you, Jason, where People are, are finding something that's so important to them. In the midst of these huge piles of rubble, they're finding this very thing that they've been looking for and hoping for, and they feel like it's a gift from God. Um, because the odds of it, it's like a needle in a haystack, right? It's just there's so much debris. Um, and, and people are feeling like God is there. And I'm hearing from people who, before this, this tragedy, they, they really weren't interested in God, right? Um, nor were they really excited about interacting with his people necessarily. But now there's this whole openness of, of them seeing how the church is responding and seeing people on the ground and feeling that love and saying, they say, wow, I have a whole new respect now for the church, and I I'm, I'm really would like to get to know this God. I want to get to know him more. Um, so, yeah, as uh, what I'm really, really excited about but also interested in as it relates to the community's needs is how to help them find God in the middle of this mess. Um, you know, big part of our training we call Share Manual, the Emmanuel process. You'll hear our colleagues, Dr. Carl Lehman, call it the Emmanuel approach. Um, Emmanuel in Hebrew means God with us. And um, we know that in theory God is there. God is here. He's here right now, but uh, we're just not used to finding out where he is, what he's doing, especially when there's hardship. Uh, one of the skills we train uh, through Thrive is called heart sight, or seeing what God sees. And so part of the healing process for folks in this whole tragedy, depending on how they're impacted, it really doesn't matter. Everybody's impacted to some degree. And what we want to do is help people find out what does God see when he looks at this. Uh, much like my friend who, you know, he had no idea what God was up to, no idea where God was until we took the time to really look and to find out. 
And as he started to interact with God, suddenly he felt taken care of. Suddenly he felt like somebody bigger than him is here. Uh, somebody bigger than me knows what's going on and knows what to do. And this started to restore a lot of peace for him. Uh, and I, I believe it's, it's going to spill into his family as well. Um, so basically what Cher Manual means is God is with us. And as we begin to encounter this reality, um, we can find out what's hindering me from perceiving where God is right now. So maybe, um, Jason, as you mentioned, you know, maybe there are people who still aren't sleeping. And they're having flashbacks. They're anxious. Many people simply just can't rest. Their mind's not stopping, which, is, um, which means they, they would be a good candidate for practicing a little bit of finding out where God is. What is God up to? Because I just want to rest a little easier. I just want to breathe, right? And so the share manual process helps us to train us. Uh, it trains us to find out God, find out where God is in the hard times. I mean, obviously, as, as believers, we want this to be a skill that all of us have, that it doesn't have to be a hard time for me to know well, where is God today as it relates to me. Uh, but especially when there's times like this where people really have some tough questions, um, why would God allow this? Where was God? And, and just some really tough questions. And uh, so. The solution I would want to give them is, well, let's, let's ask him. Let's talk to him. Let's interact with him. Um, and the good thing is it does restore our peace. It does help us resolve uh, those traumas. And it gives us this new lens to, to view reality. So where was God that morning? You know, when I heard the crashing going on around my house, what was he doing? Um, and the, the, the exciting thing about this is when people start to have that interaction in the middle of some of this, uh, difficulty. They'll say things like, wow, now I see Jesus is here with me. Um, well, we'll say, what is he doing? Well, wow, he's actually, I feel like he's protecting me. He's sheltering me from this tornado that's destroying my house. Um, and the, the neat result of this kind of interaction is peace. Right? I now have peace in a new place that I did not uh, have before. Um, it doesn't mean the bad thing, you know, the bad things still happen, but now I have the addition of peace in the middle of it, and my brain starts to process that. So people will uh, basically be able to find some help in whatever has not been fully resolved in the brain. Um, because the way that our brain works, friends, quite simply, is our minds are used to looking at pain, right? If I have a backache, I'm sitting in this chair trying to talk to you, there's a lot of mental energy going on in here focusing on what's happening on my back and wishing that it would just go away. Our minds are used to focusing on the things that hurt us, the things that scare us, and the things that bother us. So part of what we do at Shepherd's House is retrain, uh, retrain the brain, retrain Christians how to start looking at um, where is God. Let's look at some, some things to be joyful. Paul might say, be thankful for everything. Um, Let's experience some peace. And as you start to notice the good things, um, you'll find that entering into states of appreciation is so much easier. Um, and when I talk to a lot of my friends who lost their homes through this tornado, the thing that's missing, the, the ingredients that are missing for them, they don't have peace, they can't slow down, they're not sleeping well, their children aren't sleeping well, their children are anxious. Um, I mean, I'm thankful this, the community has been really, really sensitive to this thing. Like every month we have, they do a tornado siren test like every Tuesday. And thankfully we did a silent one uh, the first Tuesday of the month. So just recently they, they still did the test, but it was silent because they didn't want to basically freak people out uh, when they heard that siren again. But I heard from a friend, she was in Bloomington that day, and the siren went off in Bloomington, and she said she just started crying. She just lost it. So... You know, those are the kinds of things when, when we hear these stories, it's like, okay, let's, let's find out where God was in the middle of this. And one of the best ways, well, there's two good ways to do this. One of the ways is just remembering joy kind of primes our nervous system. And so if I'm going to help somebody who is really lacking some serious peace right now, I'm not going to say, well, let's go back and get all stirred up in the pain, and let's see how, you know, let, let's see how bad we can make this for you. Um, not at all, because we don't want people, we don't want to let people sit in their pain while they wait for peace. 
it's just not going to be a pleasant experience. But I will say, hey, let's talk about some times where you did have some joy. Let's, let's let this be a, a starting place, so to speak. Because what will happen is healing will take about six times longer if people are trying to figure it all out from being in the midst of their pain. Um, right? It's just not going to go well. Some people can pull it off. But most people consistently, when they're already stirred up in their pain and then they're trying to figure out where God was, will say things like, well, I just feel like my, my prayers are bumping on the ceiling. Uh, I don't feel like God's here with me. Um, and their connection to God will be the worst in the midst of, in the middle of their pain. So we want to keep this in mind. There's a lot of well-intentioned counselors out there, uh, including myself when I started out, that miss this essential piece of starting with, you know, something that I appreciate, something that brings me joy, something that puts a smile on my face. Uh, this helps us get into relational mode. It helps our bodies quiet. The other uh, wonderful place to start. We call it interactive memory. And that's when I remember times where God was with me before. So when I'm praying with somebody, I'll say, have you ever felt like God was with you before? Let's let's talk about that for a minute. They might say, yeah, when my, when my son was born, I tell you what, I felt like God was right there, and here's why, and here's how it feels. Then this would be the starting point, ideally. Because what we do from there is basically say, well, as you enjoy this moment where God is with you, um, let's talk to him about where he was over here in this other place. But let's let's talk to him from this from this point uh, right here. And it actually makes it safe for people to say, well, Jesus, I thank you that you were here when my son was born, and I love it, and it feels great. But over there, when my house was falling apart, I have no idea where you were. What what is hindering me from finding or perceiving you in that place? And they might have a thought of saying, well, I feel like Jesus is saying he was there with me. i say, okay, well, why don't you ask him what, what is he doing? I'll say, well, you know, I'm so terrified I'm not even looking. Okay, well, let's just catch our breath, right? Remember what it's like when your son was born, how that feels? God's right there. And then now let's ask him, okay, what, you know, what is needed for you to be able to kind of open your eyes because they're closed because you're terrified? i say, well... I feel like I just need to breathe, and, and so I'm going to catch my breath. Okay. Now, you know, I, I, I feel like Jesus is saying he's, his, his arm is around me. I can actually feel some peace about that. And so what, what we do is we start interacting with Jesus. It's very simple. We talk to him, and we notice what he has to say. We notice the thoughts that he brings to our mind. So as we would say, we share minds with God. We share feelings and thoughts with God until we have God peace. And so I keep I would keep asking person, well what why don't you ask God? What do you need next? All right? And the the nice thing about this process, besides it just being very simple and effective, um, anytime people lose their awareness of God being with them, we always return to that place, the last place that we had the awareness. So if my friend is saying, you know, I lost it, I don't know where God is, now I'm just angry. Okay, don't force it. Let's go back to where you did have that awareness of God being with you. And it's actually a very gentle approach, and it's a safe approach for people. Um, and the really cool thing about this is people can start to tell others what happened when they perceived God was with them. What changed for you when you felt peace? And so we'd say, go, go tell your people. Go tell your family. Go tell your friends. What changed when you felt like God was there in a new place? And... Uh, you know, the, the, the fun thing about that step is it gives the listeners an opportunity to try this. It kind of primes them from trying it themselves. But it also retrains our brain. So when I tell Jason what changed for me when I felt like God was with me, my brain will want to start looking for God the next time I'm upset, the next time I'm overwhelmed, the next time I'm anxious, the next time I'm up at 3 a.m. and I can't sleep. My brain will say, well, I wonder where God is right now. I wonder if he's with me because he was with me over here. I wonder if he's with me right now. And so what we call this is an inductive study of God's presence, right? Because people are starting to experience the God who hears, the God who heals, the God who forgives, who loves, who gives us hope, who knows us and who is with us. And this is a God of peace, we might say, a God of shalom which is really exciting. Like This is the kind of God that, that we know. This is the type of God who, um, who watches over us. 
And uh, the storytelling component, as I mentioned, is also good for evangelism. You know, the fun thing about this process is you actually don't have to be a believer to try it. God will gladly introduce himself to you if you don't um, really subscribe to the faith, we might say. And so as we've practiced this, we practiced it with folks, people from other religions, people who are atheists. And we've had these wonderful stories of how people have said, you know what, if this is who uh, Jesus really is, this is who I want as my God. Uh, so folks have come into the faith because of practicing this. Uh, that, for me, is like so exciting. Um, so it's self-propagating, which, which basically means this is something you do that you can take home with you. And you can hear more about it. I mean, there's so much more I could, I could talk about. But the, the focus for today is um, this is what we are um, really wanting you to understand, to hear from us, that this is, this is a way as uh, our, our church, our community, this is a way that we're trying to give some life and spread some life around to those who need it. Um, Dr. Wilder has a wonderful testimony of how this has worked, testing it on the mission field. Um, at New Life, Jason's, uh, Jason and his staff let us run the 2011 share manual, and we had a focus on this training. And in the evenings, uh, Wilder talked about this. And i got to say, there was not a dry eye in the room when he talked about this for those three days. They, and we actually were blessed to have it recorded. So that's what the 2011 share manual trainings are. Um, one of the resources we're going to be passing out to the community here is a share manual, the Healing Lifestyle book. It's just basically a way that if people don't come to some of the things that we're offering, at least they can take it home and, and try to practice this as well. But um, we're hoping that we'll be able to reach, uh, reach a lot of the community. And uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, Carl and Charlotte Lehman, they have so much information unpacking this beautiful process at uh, theemmanualapproach.com. Carl's writing an, an actually a new book about the Emmanuel Approach, and he's already posting sections of it on his website. So if this is all brand new to you, I highly, highly, highly recommend visit his website. There's tons of information there. You won't be disappointed because people have questions. Well, what if this happens? What if I'm praying with somebody and this happens? Those are the kinds of things that, that you'll find some answers for. Uh, so I've had a number of requests from people. What can I do to help? Like, what do you guys need? How can I be praying for you? Um, well, prayer is obviously one of the best things you can do. We need people praying for us. As Jason shared, um, just, you know, people of the congregation, they left church having no idea what happened. They try to get home, and there's a pile of rubble. So you can imagine the impact of, on families, on their neighbors, on the community. Uh, people need prayers right now. They just need comfort. They need some healing. They need some joy. I mean, the, the rebuilding process is going to take a long time. All right? It's going to take months. It's going to take years. And so really people need joy to endure. I mean, we just need some joy to endure. So let's pray that uh, God will really provide those opportunities for the community to build joy um, and to find some healing for the post-traumatic stress. Uh, some of you have asked, what can I do for Shepherd's House? I know you guys are trying to do stuff there. You know, friends friends who are wanting to do that, you can just visit our Life Model uh, giving page, and you can find ways that you can support what we're doing. Um, the goal here, you know, as far as I see it, uh, the goal here is for churches to be prepared with a manual. How, do we, how can we help people who come to us and they're hurting and they're stuck? Um, they're looking for joy. We want churches to kind of be that joyful place, as Jason said. You know, they're out there. They're the, the hands and the feet of Jesus, basically. People are experiencing God through the church right now. Um, and they can be a joyful community where the weak and the strong are together, working together. Whether it's a storm, an earthquake, a shooting, a disaster, crime, I mean, this is just a very, very practical tool that... Uh, we can uh, we we want to offer, and um, one of the things I'm really excited about with with New Life with with uh, Jason and the the pastors there they're they're opening up a time for the community to come in and actually receive some ministry on December 18th, the evening of December 18th. So that's one area I'd really like prayer on. Um, we're going to try to provide these opportunities over time. 
that the community can come in and, and receive and practice actually the share manual process and try to get a little more peace into some of what's happened. I am really, really, really excited about that. And that is where we just want to pray that God will uh, bring his reign, we might say, to help these folks who are hurting, who are suffering, and just, just basically need some joy. They need some peace. Um, Jason, are there any other thoughts that you have as far as anything that I've said here? Any, any other needs your congregation has or even that the community might have that you're aware of? Well, um, right now, uh, I mean, when it comes to the people from New Life, we truly are at a stopping point. I've got, um, I had a couple of people last weekend say, hey, could you put a crew together for me? Um, I think we want to go back in and do some detailed cleanup because we want to uh, we want to close down our place for the winter and start the rebuild in the spring. And so, um, you know, talking physical on the on the ground kind of needs, we're a bit at a stopping point. And uh, community wise, it's just um, I think I already mentioned it's a, a lot of what was hit was an affluent area, and uh, just that just means people who have insurance, people who um, there's a lot of people who know how to handle this kind of thing um, in the sense of the physical side of it, and uh, and they're doing pretty well. There's a handful of people who are in uh, apartment complexes and that sort of thing who probably aren't in the same um, financial boat. We're trying to figure out whether we need to press in and give help there. Right now, there are because we don't have facility, we're uh, renting our, our facility. Um, a couple of, there are three other local churches that um, are – uh, they have a facility right there in the community, have, were affected by things. The vast majority of their members were involved in some sort of uh, you know, damage or their place was lost. and So they've got uh, these centers of places where they receive items and help and that sort of thing. So they are, they are playing a role of the church in the community there, and we're just trying to be supportive of them. We know some of their leadership um, and just uh, trying, to, trying to work with them in whatever way we can. Um, I guess uh, you know, I'll be curious to know how it plays out over the course of the next a uh, few weeks because I know that uh, I know Washington isn't going to be the same uh, in the sense that yeah. they've been they've been through something the community's been through something now that uh, they've never been through before and I imagine that over time their uh, you know your description of that person uh, having a reaction when the uh, siren went off yeah. um, there's that stuff that's deep down in people um, that they don't even know is there sometimes I think and uh, and then you get that trigger that uh, that kind of brings it all up. Um, I'm imagining that that's probably going to happen. I, I imagine when we hit the spring and we get our typical storm season around here in central Illinois, there might be a lot of people who go through um, a significant amount of angst compared to what they may have the previous year. And, uh, you know, yeah. uh, my mentality on that is let's figure out who they are, help them to, you know, find out that God was present and and uh, loves them and cares for them and protective of them in the, in the, in the moment. Uh, so that they can keep living their lives without um, being hindered or or, uh, or hung up by the uh, by the stuff that's happened in their past. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I uh, if you're asking for specifics today, I don't necessarily that's, have anybody saying please, yeah. please come help me. But uh, yeah. but I do believe those things are absolutely going to exist and pop up over the course yeah. of the next weeks and months. All right. Now I know we've got some questions here. Um, I imagine new life. Well. I'd like to give the New Life website in case people would. If, if there is anything New Life's doing they want to put on their website, I should put that on here for folks, especially for those who are watching, because we're going to have a lot of friends who are watching this later. So um, I'm going to put the website down here for folks to see. Do you remember the website off the top of your head, Jason? You need me to give you this. It's, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, www.newlifeonline.org. All right. I, I, I knew it was close to that. I didn't know if it was .com or .org. All right, so, Danny, I know we've got some questions here. Um, you want to invite folks to ask friends? You can ask Jason a question. You've heard his story. You hear this guy's on the ground um, serving this community. Uh, maybe there's there's some words people want to ask, something uh, that's... Well, actually, I had a couple of... Um... Well, one kind of a technical question. She, it was a therapist who's never heard the six times longer statistics that you gave. She's wondering where you discovered this and if you had any research data on it. Yeah. Or towards. Yes, I would. I'll check with Wilder if we have actually something written up. But this is a lot of what I've shared is actually when we've tested this on the mission field, when we've tested this with groups, um, we've kind of been able to contrast what 
happens with the share manual process that they're using? What happens with the traditional process? So there's been a lot of comparing, and um, from from everything that I've I've heard from the people testing this six times was was safely. Uh, but if she could he, he or she could email me, I'll find out uh, if Wilder has something written up on that. Okay, I'll pass along your yeah. email. All right, and um, David Corbett had a question about, um, could you please post the site where portions of his new book are being posted? I'm not sure which book he was referring to there, so David. Probably Carl's, Carl's, and I will, that is the emmanuelapproach.com. Okay. Where Carl is unpacking, how, how would I do this? What would this look like, and so forth. Okay. Now, here's a good one. Do you have any other stories about using the Emanuel process with people experiencing PTSD after the tornado? I'd love to hear a play-by-play -play about how the process went and how I could replicate it in a similar situation elsewhere. Well, we've got some stories um, starting. Our actually open community times are coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're working with a couple churches, including New Life. Um, so one of the things I'm planning on doing is actually being able to sh let people share their stories if they want to share their stories. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to hear more on the the PTSD on the mission field, we've got that share manual CD unpacks uh, what this looks like in one country where it was um, tribal conflict that was really really violent, as well as some uh, I think it was a uh, Oh, uh, some kind of storm that swept through this region. Um, so that that would be the best resource now. I guess I would I would encourage you to to look at. I will have some stories coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so yeah. stay tuned, Jessica. And we don't have much time, but I know Marion wanted to see if you could walk us all through an manual process. <laughs> sure. While we're listening. Well, yeah, very simply, let's say what I would what I would have you do right now is think of think of a time you felt like God was with you. All right. So for me, I think about a time going through the uh, the Canadian Rockies where I was watching these beautiful mountains uh, with a blue sky background, and I was just kind of in my head thanking God for this beauty that He's given me to enjoy. And as I was having this wonderful little moment, uh, I had this really cool thought of Jesus saying, well, you're excited about these mountains and the animals and the water, and that's wonderful. But what I'm excited about is my creation, my people. That's what's exciting to me. That's, that's the best of my creation right there. And I was pleasantly surprised by this wonderful little God moment. And um, so any time I think about that, I, I let my mind go back there. I remember what it felt like. I enjoy it. I enjoy the appreciation. But I enjoy feeling like, wow, God is right here with me. Right? So then in my the next step would be, okay, as I remember that wonderful little moment right there, um, I would say, well, Lord, where are you right now as it relates to me? What would you like me to know about your presence with me today? And, wow, you know, I, as I'm remembering the wonderful moment, looking at those mountains, I feel like God's right there with me. Suddenly I have this little thought that Jesus is standing right next to me. Just peaceful little thought, very gentle, flowing thought, nothing, no, no lightning bolt, anything like that, but just this little comforting thought. And so then what I would do now is talk to Jesus. What is, Lord, what is on your mind? I'm enjoying how it feels for you. Uh, but, Lord, yesterday when my wife ran over my foot with the minivan, you know, I have no idea where you were. Now she really did <laughs> run over my foot, but let's just say she did for, for the moment. Lord, I don't know where you were. In fact, I'm really angry about the whole deal because uh, my foot hurts and my shoes ruined, and you know what? That was really bad. So what I would do as I'm enjoying just feeling like Jesus is sta standing next to me, I would say, Lord, what's hindering me from you right there? What were you doing? What's hindering me from finding you? Well, wow, I feel like I need to forgive my wife. I was really mad at her. Okay, well, Lord, I forgive my wife for running over my foot. Well, suddenly I, I have this little, uh, well, I have a lot more peace as I start to share this with Jesus, but suddenly I also start to feel like he was right there with me, um, shielding my foot from what could have been a lot worse of an accident. And then 
as I start to enjoy and share that with Jesus, maybe I have some feelings about the whole deal I need to share with him. Guess what I'm going to do? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go tell my wife what happened. And I'm going to say, honey, you're not going to believe what just happened. I was just having this wonderful little interaction with Jesus. And you remember yesterday when you ran over my foot, I was really mad at you, but I really hurt. Um, suddenly, and as I talked to Jesus, what he was doing right there, I feel like he was with me. And I feel like, you know what, he, he actually protected my foot from having worse damage than what it did. And um, I, you know, I'm really sorry that I yelled at you. It was an accident. You didn't mean to do that. But I focus on the changes that happened when I felt like God was there. Now, that's pretty minor, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. It would hurt if she runs over my foot. Um, but if it's something that, like a, like a tornado, I might need somebody who can walk me through those steps. So if I get stuck, they can steer me back and say, okay, don't force it. Let's go back to where you feel like God was with you before. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the simple three steps that, that, uh, that we're trying to train people on. Um, now there's a lot of troubleshooting, you know, there's a lot of different things we would want to help people learn, but very simply, that's what it would look like. So Marion, that's a good question. I hope that at least gives people a little bit of an idea um, what I'm talking about. Very oh, um, good. Yeah, we'll probably have only just a moment left. Any, any other questions or thoughts before? No, I have someone teasing, thinking that um, Pastor Jason had seven kids. I said, no, it's only six. And they said, whew, only six. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That's the only We are answer. precious. <laughs> well, Pastor Jason, I just want to thank you. You know, I really appreciate what you're doing on the ground, what you're doing for the community, all that New Life's doing to try to really help out uh, and comfort a hurting community. So thank you. I think we're, I think we're on um, mute. Thank you guys so there much for being uh, you know awesome and being great about just understanding what people need in the moment. Yes, thank you. It's been good to have you here. We're going to have to have you back sometime. Sounds good. <laughs> all right. Well, Denny, thank you for making this happen, and um, I just want to thank all of our viewers here, all of you who are with us. Thank you for for checking this out. I hope uh, I hope it's been helpful and, and joyful and inspiring as you uh, you try to apply some of the stuff in your own life, your own ministry. Um, next week I'm going to talk about how to increase joy over the holidays and decrease stress. So I'm going to encourage you, anyone still interested in how to start joy and what that would look like very practically, especially as uh, Jason and I are trying to help uh, in our church and our friends and our community are trying to really serve this community right now and help them get back on their feet. Joy is going to be a fundamental part of that whole process. Uh, so I hope those of you who are interested in Joy can check back in with me next week. That will be at 3 p.m. So next Thursday. All right. God bless all of you. Thank you for being here with us. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.